Hello, everybody, and welcome to another beautiful Thursday. It's so nice to see the sun shining here in New York. We've had lots of rain, and so it's really nice to see some nice weather. I was out in my garden this morning planting some calendula and uh, some other flowers. Um, and the vegetables are coming in. I already have radishes and collard beans, and it's exciting. So anyway, lots of stuff going on, lots of stuff in the news I want to share with you. Um, of course, what's going on in Alabama and the um, Senate um, turning back abortion rights um, is really a scary thing. Um, but I'm not even going to talk about that right now because there's so many other things to talk about. But um, you know, we are living in an interesting world. My guest today is going to be Leda Meredith. She is a forager. She's been on my radio show before, back in uh, 2011. And I'm really excited to have her back to talk about her new book, The Skillful Forager. And I'll tell you more about her in a little bit when she comes on. But um, I want to share some things going on in the news. Of course, share my recipe with you um, and some events that are going on locally. So um, I shared with many of you that I took on a position as the farm to school coordinator at a local public school. Uh, they received a New York state grant to bring in more fresh vegetables, not so much into the lunch program as much as a harvest over the month, a tasting so that the kids can actually experience what a fresh farm grown vegetable tastes like with the hope that we can introduce them, get them to like it and find funding to bring it into the school pro program. So, um, I'm just getting started. We're doing our first tasting, um, next week with asparagus um but you know talking about school food and looking at what's going on i just want to share with you that there i have a petition um on my website to reach out to our ad current administration because right now the center for science in the public interest is suing the trump administration because they are rolling back some of the advances that the obama administration had put into the school lunch program as you know school lunch program is pretty sad the way it is right now um you know it is better than it was meaning that there's more whole grains and um they are requiring a fresh or a vegetable i can't say fresh a vegetable and fruit at each meal um but of course what i'm trying to do is bring in fresh vegetables so that they actually might like them i mean you can't compare a canned green bean to a real green bean um but anyway i have a petition to try to um, to let lend a hand to the Center for Science and the Public Interest in support of their uh, suing of the Trump administration for these rollbacks. So um, please join in on that. Um, there was also a really disturbing article, an article that really, you know, got me fired up in the New York Times about the 5G network. And their headline was, you know, your 5G phone won't hurt you, but Russia wants you to think otherwise. And that's making a blank statement that 5G is not dangerous at all. And the truth is, we don't know about that. And um, putting it all on Russia is just not real. I n know a lot of people and organizations working to raise awareness about this 5G network that they are um, putting, you know, putting out across the country and many countries without any real testing as to its safety. And there's a lot of people that have a lot of concern and I'm one of them. Um, you know, it's much harder once they do something to undo it. So it's better to really look at it uh, um, objectively before it gets installed. And yes, I know there's billions of dollars for the phone companies to make and for lots of people to make money off of this. But as we've seen historically, that is not the bottom line. Um, so please, um, you know, look, at my website, I have uh, petitions and letter, suggested letters to sign and write. Um, and it's just really important that we all take action. I talk about this all the time. I went to a Mother's Day Bjork concert this weekend at the new event space in the city, the shed at the Hudson Yards. And it was a wonderful concert. Bjork is a true artist. Um, as an artist myself, I really appreciate her bringing music and dance and visual all together. Um, it was just amazing. But one of the most impactful things is at the very end, they, she had the young Swedish student who's 16 years old now, who started an, an international movement of boycotting school on Fridays to raise awareness about climate change. 
she had a five minute video talk from her that was just so moving. It, it literally had me in tears. If we don't do something about our climate situation, if we don't really take action, there will be no future for our children children and our grandchildren and we all need to really take it on seriously and push our elected officials to do the same because if we don't we're not going to have a planet that we will be able to inhabit the earth will remain and it will come back but we may not be on it and as we all saw the united nations um, assessment report recently that talked about a million species at the risk of extinction that's real and um, the human impact is responsible for it. And so we need to do things to turn it around. Agriculture is one of the things that can do it, um, not only by improving our methods so that we are not adding to greenhouse gas emissions, but also so that we can help sequester some of the carbon back into the earth. And right now with the um, tearing down of the Amazon and the rainforests and, you know, all four meat production for grazing or for monoculture it's just bad and so there's so many issues that are really troubling right now take your pick but do take a pick and pick something and get involved and do something you know we just can't all you know work and you know ignore put our heads in the sand and pretend it's not happening because it is happening and so it's really up to all of us to take some action and do something about it I want to share with you some things that are coming up that are really exciting and fun to do in the New York area. Um, tonight, a uh, uh, guest spiritual um, holistic physician and spiritual teacher, Gabriel Cousins, will be out on Long Island at the Holistic Center for Soulful, Soulful Living. That's on Long Island in Smithtown this evening from 7 to 9, if you're interested in that. This weekend, uh, Slow Food East End, and Slow Food, for those that don't know, their tagline is good, fair, um, clean, good, and fair. And they are all about good food and the pleasures of food and making sure that everyone along the food chain is being taken care of. Anyway, Slow Food East End is having a potluck at the Shinnecock Reservation. And one of the things Slow Food is really working to do is to acknowledge uh, the First Nations and to bridge gaps and to do more things with indigenous um, locals and so this is a potluck at the Shinnecock Reservation and there will be a presentation there um, it's a potluck so bring something to share and I hope to see you there that's Sunday um, from 4 to 7 here on Long Island um, and then next week my slow food chapter slow food North Shore is having a farm gathering at Elijah Farm and Elijah Farm is a wonderful small organic farm in South Huntington that is working with young autistic adults. And um, we will have a farm tour. We'll show a short, short video about the slow food movement. Um, it is also a potluck and it will just be a gathering for us all to come together. One of the, um, one of the missions of slow food is just bringing people together who care about good food and the pleasures of food. And so we hope you can join us. On May 23rd in New York City, there's a food waste fair. Uh, just Google food waste fair New York City and you'll find more information about that. Of course, I have information on my website as well if you are interested in that. But it's really, um, it's really for everybody to help us all figure out ways that we can reduce our food waste, which is responsible for like 40% of the uh, greenhouse gases in the landfill. So um, food waste is a real issue. Food Tank, another wonderful nonprofit organization that is a food think tank um, also about good clean and fair food and um, Danielle Nuremberg brings people together all the time and she's having a live talk series um, one was um, not last night the night before last Tuesday evening and um, there's three more coming up one's on June 11th one's on July 16th and one's on August 13th and you can get tickets on Eventbrite. If there aren't tickets left, it will be live streamed as well. But it's at NYU and Pless Hall. And um, she has some really great speakers. So go to the Food Tank website and you can find out more about that. And two more things I want to share. Slow Food Nations is July 19th coming up in Denver. 
And that's bringing all the slow food chapters. There's over 150 slow food chapters in the USA, plus some international chapters um, coming together in Denver for a big outdoor food party, lots of conversations, lots of events going on. A lot of it is free. Some of it has tickets. So um, you can check out Slow Food Nations online as well. And on August 23rd, NOFA New York, the Northeast Organic Farming Association, the New York chapter is having their big gala up in Poughkeepsie. And um, I am now on the board of NOFA New York and would like to invite all of my listening friends to join us at this gala. Um, you can find tickets online at nofanewyork.org. And um, if anyone has any silent auction or live auction items that they'd like to donate, we are looking for those at this current time. So please join us. Now, lastly, I want to share with you this week's recipe before I invite Letta on to join us. Um, and, you know, make, putting dinner on the table is something that we all have to do every night. Hopefully we all are in the kitchen cooking. And, um, you know, I have lots of asparagus coming out of my garden. This is my first year, so I've been eating lots of asparagus. So this is a seitan and pepper dinner. Um, with some mushrooms, broccoli, and asparagus. And, you know, most of the recipes that I'm sharing with you are nothing fancy, nothing that, you know, they're always a work in progress. I just kind of whip them together. And, um, you know, sometimes they're really great, and sometimes they're good, but not really great. And um, this one is really great. I want to share it with you. So I used two cups of, um, I had some seitan that I had made from scratch, but you can, of course, buy some seitan. Um, Field Roast has a good brand of, um, they call it a meatloaf. It's a seitan. You can cut that up. Or um, other West West Foods has um, has a brand as well. You can cut that up. But anyway, get two cups of seitan. If you don't like seitan, if you're gluten-free, of course, you can substitute tempeh or tofu for this. Um, and cut it into cubes. One onion cut in half and then sliced into crescent moons. One half head of organic broccoli cut into florets a half an organic red pepper, and a half a yellow pepper. I just love adding peppers. They just bring so much color to the dish. One bunch of asparagus, and um, I love cutting them on the angle, about two inches long. Uh, one eight-ounce package of organic baby portobello mushrooms sliced. Two tablespoons of minced ginger, two tablespoons of chopped garlic, a half a cup of frozen peas, olive oil. I used a quarter cup of marsala wine. Uh, two to four tablespoons of tamari, depending on your taste, a half a cup of water, a half a cup of good-tasting nutritional yeast, a quarter cup of chopped parsley, and two cups of cooked pasta or brown rice. And again, you know, I look in my refrigerator, I had some leftover rice pasta, and that's what I put in. If I had brown rice, I would have put that in. Um, it's really flexible. And a lot of these recipes, if you don't have a certain vegetable, if you don't have broccoli and you have cauliflower, great, throw that in. It's really interchangeable. Um, so one of the things I love about cooking is it really is a creative process and you're free to do as you'd like in the kitchen as opposed to baking, which is much more scientific and you really can make a flop with baking, but it's hard to really make a flop with a stir fry when you're using all good vegetables. So you're going to start by covering the bottom of the wok with a little bit of oil. I'm trying to use less and less oil. So um, once, you know, if you start with a little bit of oil and then it starts sticking, instead of adding more oil, I've been adding more water. I'm um, just a little, like a tablespoon at a time, and that deglazes the pan, keeps it from sticking, and you can really reduce the amount of oil you use in your stir fry. So I add one tablespoon of garlic and one tablespoon of ginger to the bottom of the wok, um, and just let that cook for a little bit uh, with the seitan. And then, or with the onions. Then I added the peppers and continued cooking for a few more minutes until the peppers start to soften. Then I added the mushrooms and let those cook down for a few more minutes. Then I added the marsala wine and another tablespoon each of garlic and ginger. And then I added the seitan. And I seared that for five minutes. So I pushed like the onions and the peppers to the side and let the seitan get down to the middle of the bottom of the wok so that could get a little seared on the edges. And um, I didn't mention that I cut the cubes into about one inch size, um, but you can cut them even smaller if you prefer. Um, then I added the water again to deglaze the pan because it started to stick. Then I added the broccoli and cooked that for a couple more minutes. Then I added the asparagus. Then I added the nutritional yeast. 
and I let the vegetables and the seitan and all cook down for just a few minutes to allow all those flavors to come together. If you need to add a little bit more water, you can. Then I added the um, tamari towards the end. I started with two tablespoons, and I think I did go up to four tablespoons. And I tossed it with parsley, and I threw in the noodles at the last minute and just stirred it up until the noodles got soft. And that was it. It was delicious. It came together really fast. And I hope you all make it. And if you do, please send me an email and share with me um, how you liked it. I love hearing from everybody. And so now it's my pleasure to introduce Letta Meredith to all of you again. Letta has been foraging since she was a toddler. She likes to say it's her grandmother's fault. She's always felt a connection to nature through wild edibles and medicinal plants. And it's her mission to share that passion and connection with others that they may enjoy the free, delicious, healthy food growing all around them in a way that benefits both them and the ecosystems they harvest from. Letta holds a certificate in ethnobotany from the New York Botanical Garden, where she's also an instructor. She conducts foraging tours, food preservation demos, and teaches medicinal and edible plant workshops for numerous organizations, including the Brooklyn Botanic Garden, Slow Food New York City, and Just Food. She's a contributor to numerous publications, including Mother Earth News, and she's the author of seven books, including the, her newest ones, The Skillful Forager and Pickling Everything. And if you want to connect with her, you can connect with her at lettameredith.com. Letta, are you with me? I am. Glad to be here. Thank you so much for joining me. I hear you're in Costa Rica right now. I am. I'm sitting sort of in the middle of the jungle. <laughs> Lucky you. Wonderful. <laughs> Wonderful. So I know you said it's your grandmother's fault, but maybe you could share with all of my listeners your st- story, how you got started foraging. Sure. Um, yeah, it is my grandmother and my great-grandmother who was still alive when I was little. It is sort of their fault. Um, my great-grandmother especially, she was first generation over from Greece. And foraging is still very much a part of the culture there. If You know, you go to even the most touristy restaurant in Athens, you'll find wild greens on the menu. So to her, it was very natural to take her granddaughter or great-granddaughter um, out in the spring and pick dandelion greens and wild mustard. And, and that was, you know, I don't think she knew the word foraging. That was just food. <laughs> right. So I was, uh, probably, I was probably about three, something like that. Uh-huh. And um, where did they grow up here? Where were you living here? Um, I grew up in San Francisco and uh-huh. moved, moved to New York when I was 16. Uh-huh. So um, in San Francisco, was there a lot growing in the area? Did you have to get out of the city? No, you don't. Um, I love opening urban dwellers' eyes to just how much wonderful uh, wild food and medicine is growing in the city because there is a a myth that you have to, you know, go off somewhere far into the wilderness to find anything good. And that's completely not true. There's stuff growing right at your feet. And that was definitely true in San Francisco as well. Uh Uh-huh. And what kind of things would you find in San Francisco growing wild? Well, a lot of the plants that you find, I'd say like (laughs) more, more than half for sure of the wild edibles that you'll find, you can actually find all across the United States. Um, And those are the invasive species, what some people like to call weeds. Um, So dandelion and mustard and um, things like that grow across North America and Europe, um, basically Northern Hemisphere. And so we found all of that in San Francisco. But then in San Francisco, you would find some things that don't grow in New York, like um, miner's lettuce, for instance, and... Vice versa, there are things that grow in New York um, that don't grow in San Francisco. So each region is special. Mm -hmm. Um, Can you talk to us a little bit about the classes that you teach and the tours that you lead? Sure. Um, So I will take people out and um, teach them how to find and identify different wild edibles and medicinals. Um, I do a lot of tours in the New York City area. And what we find really depends on the time of year. So if it's, you know, at at this time of year, um, if I'm doing a New York tour, we're looking for mulberries, we're looking for June berries. It's like the start of the fruit season. There'll also be a lot of greens. There'll be 
pokeweed and uh, wild spinach. If I do a tour in September, it's a completely different palette. Then we're looking for black walnuts and acorns and um, a lot of great wild mushrooms like maitake that grow wild uh, in New York. And so depending on the time of year, I'll be leading people to look at different things. And then we discuss quite a bit about sustainable harvesting methods um, because a, a forager has a unique opportunity to interact with the ecosystem in a way that can actually benefit the ecosystem as well as putting some fabulous food on your plate if you know what you're doing and practice sustainable harvesting methods. Um, if you come in with no clue and just kind of hack at the plants, you can do some damage. So there's a learning curve there. Um, and I love teaching people about that so that if they do go out foraging on their own, you know, after the tour, uh, they know what they're doing and they're actually creating a win-win situation with the environment. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. I know this time of year, I always look for ramps and, um, um, what are the spiral ferns? Um, the ostrich fern fiddleheads. Fiddleheads. Yeah. I cooked fiddleheads last night. They're great. I love, I love them. Um, uh, where do you find those? Well, those are two, um, you'll find lots of those in Hudson Valley, um, less in the city. Those are two, it's actually a great example because those are two relatively slow growing native plants. Um, they're native uh, to the whole eastern seaboard. And ramps is a really good example because everyone gets very excited about ramps or wild leeks. In the spring, they're only available for a few weeks. They show up on, you know, restaurant menus, kind of a specialty item. And in some parts of the Northeast, they're still plentiful. But in some areas, they're actually considered an endangered species. And that is directly because of people harvesting them incorrectly and getting a little greedy, to be honest. Um, there's a way to harvest the ramps that they regenerate, which is to leave part of the root in the ground. Uh, but it's slower. It takes more time. And people who are harvesting for the restaurant industry or to bring to the markets are usually in a hurry to get as much quantity as possible in as short a time as possible. So they're just digging up clumps of the, the ramps. And just to give you an idea, it takes seven years uh, for ramps to sort of reach full harvestable size from seed. So that little clump that somebody just dug up is going to be bare for seven years. And um, But on the other hand, like I was saying, there's a way to do it. There are sustainable methods that you can come in and you can harvest all this delicious springtime special food and still be allowing that um, particular population, that plant population, to thrive. Um, mm -hmm. So I great. I'm hearing the birds in the background. <laughs> <laughs> so lovely. <laughs> Good. Oh, it's beautiful. Beautiful. Um, so what are some of the, um, what can you do with pokeweed? I have lots of that. What do people <laughs> do with pokeweed? Yeah. You know, well, <laughs> pokeweed is interesting because it is a native North American species and it can also be invasive. And usually it's the non-native species that are more invasive, but poke is an exception. Um, so Pokeweed, we're talking about Phytolaca, um, is not edible raw, and that's not a culinary choice. That's a health issue. It can be toxic raw. Um, you have to boil it, and you have to harvest it at the correct stage. And the correct stage is when it is basically unbranched and green and before it flowers. And at that stage, you boil it, and you end up with a very mild, wonderful vegetable with a texture that's a little bit like asparagus, actually. Um, doesn't taste like asparagus, has its own taste, but the texture is very similar. So I do, uh, I do poke quiche and throw poke into um, rice and, you know, any, anywhere the asparagus would be good. But again, it's not going to taste exactly like asparagus, but, but it has a very similar uh, texture to it. Wow, I didn't realize pokeweed is what they make phytolaca from, the um, homeopathic remedy? Yeah, yeah, it is. Wow, um, phytolaca is great. I used to use that all the time with my kids and they'd have a cough and, yeah. Yeah, it's a big lymphatic system cleanser. 
Um, homeopathic is right because it's used in tiny, tiny doses um, because it can be toxic if the, in higher doses. Mm-hmm. Wow. So let's talk about your new book, The Skillful Forager. Um, you've written seven or six others. So how is this one different from um, some of the other foraging books that are out there? Well, I've got, um, you know, two other foraging books. This is my third foraging book. And then, like, there are lots of other great books out there. Um, Just comparing to my own and the ones I have in my library, um, one of my books that I wrote for foraging was specifically a field guide to the Northeast. It's regional. And um, will help people who are outdoors identify what they're looking at and find out if they can use it as food. Uh, but it doesn't have recipes, and it's really just a field guide. And so then I wanted to do some recipes, so I did a book called The Forager's Feast. And again, there are also other wild food cookbooks out there um, that was all recipes. And this one, The Skillful Forager, I'm very excited about because there aren't that many books like it in the field. It's technique-based, and it's focusing on things like what I described uh, with the ramps, sustainable harvesting method how how can you gather this particular kind of wild crop in a way that doesn't damage the ecosystem that you're gathering in um, is a big priority and then also uh, some universal recipes for ways to work with wild greens and ways to you know with wild food um, often the tastes are stronger uh, more intense than cultivated foods, which tend to be raised for bulk and, and blandness in a way. Think like iceberg lettuce. Um, right. <laughs> and so, so with wild Not foods. Not a real food. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> so with wild foods, um, knowing how to prepare them in ways that don't try to hide those intense flavors, but acknowledge that you are playing with some intense flavors in the kitchen and how to make that delicious um, because I always say there's a difference between edible and good. And if people are going to make foraging part of their diet, um, it needs to taste good. So there's also stuff in the book about that. Um, but it's very much a technique-based book. Uh-huh. Well, that's, that's needed so badly. Um, you know, because like I said, I, you know, I, I know what pokeweed looks like when it's when it's flowering, that's how I know what it is. I don't know if I would recognize it before it flowers. Yeah. Is there, how would you recognize it? Can you give us a, well, a great, um, a great tip is actually to do what you just described to identify something in the flowering or fruiting stage when it's really easy to identify and, you know, you can cross check with the field guide and you won't be able to mix it up with anything else. And in the case of pokeweed, it's a perennial, so it's going to come up in the same spot from the same rootstock every year. So go ahead and identify it when it is in flower, and it's easy to identify, and then Mm -hmm. come back to your spot, um, which this is the time of year. May is is poke season, uh, at least in New York. And pay attention to, you know, like I said, it's funny that you're bringing up poke because I would say that's not a beginner's plant. (laughs) Uh Uh-huh. Okay. Okay. Because of the fact that you can't eat it raw, you do have to boil it. That's a, a health issue thing uh, that you have to gather it at the right stage. Um, but with that said, it's it's very learnable. But um, you don't just – it's not so much a question of is this plant edible or not. It's which part of the plant is edible at what stage and how do I have to prepare it. And poke is a good example because it has safety issues with all of those. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Another thing that someone had shared with me a while ago, um, they said that if you find poison ivy early spring, that you can actually eat a little bit of it and become um, build your immune system up against poison ivy. Are you familiar with that at all? I have heard of that, and I have no intention of trying it. <laughs> <laughs> uh-huh. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Yeah, you know what? I have I've only had poets and I've a little bit once in my life. I mean, I actually I don't think I'm that susceptible because I've, you know, when I was younger, I actually picked it for my mother because it was so pretty, and um, and yeah, I didn't I, get it. So, I'm I've never gotten a bad rash. My mom is very sensitive to poison poison ivy, um, but that's also one where people can develop adult onset allergies with it. So just because you haven't 
reacted to it in the past doesn't mean you won't. Right. Uh, right. So still, still better to stay away. Right. Right. Um, so you're saying pokeweed's not a beginner, um, a beginner foraging weed. Um, can you share with us what would be a good beginner one right now growing sure. in the eastern? Um, so garlic mustard, um, Aliaria pediolata, garlic mustard is an invasive weed that is all over the place. <laughs> it has heart-shaped leaves with scalloped edges. Um, and at the stage it's at now where it's shooting up its flower stalks, but they haven't yet opened. The flower heads kind of look like little baby broccolis. And in, in fact, it is in the same plant family as broccoli. And if you like bro broccoli, Rob, um, this is your friend. It's called garlic mustard for a reason. It's got that kind of spicy flavor to it. You can eat as long as they're still tender. You can eat the stalks, the leaves, the flowers, everything. Mm -hmm. um, and you are doing a good deed harvesting that one. It's also very easy to confirm your ID. I mean, again, you always, that's rule number one of foraging is um, to be 100% sure of your ID. But this is a really easy one to look up um, and just double check your ID characteristics, especially because it smells like garlic and mustard. <laughs> so uh -huh. you might find something else that you think, oh, the leaf shape like looks a little similar. Um, violets, for example, also have heart-shaped leaves with toothed margins, but violet leaves don't have any smell. And garlic mustard is unmistakably garlicky and mustardy and absolutely right. delicious. Great. And you can stir fry it and cook it up the same way you would broccoli rub, correct? Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh -huh. Wonderful, wonderful. Um, so in addition, you explained, you know, about harvesting responsibly when it came to the ramp. So there's some other tips that you have in your book. I'm sure there are, since you have a whole book <laughs> of other tips that you want to share with us about foraging responsibly. Yeah, it's, um, I'd say the first thing to learn, like you've just found a plant, you ID'd it, you're excited because you find out this thing that you just ID'd is edible. Um, the first thing is to find out, is it an invasive species or is it a slower growing species? If it's an invasive species like the garlic mustard that I was just talking about, then you can kind of have that and you don't even have to worry about sustainability. Um, if it's a slower growing native species, then you want to look and see, is the plant abundant where I found it? Is there a lot of it in this spot? And don't take all of it. Um, leave more than you take always um, is, a, is a good rule. Um, and, that's a, if, and if you weren't sure, is this invasive or is it not invasive? I don't really know. My book doesn't say. Um, if it's my book, it'll say. <laughs> but, but if the one that you happen to have doesn't, then the rule is always just leave more than you, than you take. Mm -hmm. um, do you have a good app that you recommend to people to um, to you know take a picture of a plant and then it identifies it for you? Because I know that's I, sometimes yeah, there so are, hard for people. There are some. Um, they do not replace a good field guide, and they're only right some of the time, in my experience. So certainly, if you're talking about something that people are going to eat or use as medicine. Um, being right some of the time is not good enough. <laughs> it needs to be yes. absolute ID. Um, and it's not that hard. This is the thing. People get, get uh, scared away from the plant ID. But really, um, a field guide is just a checklist. Um, you go through and you go, I'll stick with the garlic mustard. Does it have heart-shaped leaves? Yeah or nay? Does it have scallop margins? Yes or no. Does it smell like garlic and mustard? Yes or no. And it's a checklist. And if everything on your list checks off yes, then you just ID to plant. Mm -hmm. um, I like to tell people if you can tell the difference between kale and chard at the store, then you know how to do plant ID. Right. Okay, well, that's pretty easy. <laughs> Good. Um, we're going to take a couple-minute break, and when we come back, I want to ask you to share one of your favorite recipes um, that you make from plants and flowers. So everyone listening, I'm talking with Letter Meredith, if you've just joined us, um, about her new book, The Skillful Forager, and you're listening to Bhavani at IE Queen. Be right back. PRPRN. PRN. PRN. Progressive Radio Network. Stay tuned. Tuned. Progressive Radio Network. 
Today we have more than 80 producers bringing forth the most progressive and most liberating information. The kind of information you do not regularly hear on any of the mainstream or alternative media. You can help us now. Up to this point, I have virtually supported the Progressive Radio Network, all of its expenses and payroll, myself. But we would like to expand our reach. We'd like to do far more. We'd like to be able to advertise on Facebook and let others know we exist. We are the number one Progressive Radio Network in the world. In fact, we have programs that are most listened to in all of Progressive Radio. But we could go a lot further. Our message can reach a lot more people, especially at a time when people are desperate for honest, objective insights on the important topical issues of our day. How can you help? It's simple. Go to prn.fm. Go to our main page. In the upper right-hand corner, you'll see a little button, Support Now. And then whatever you can contribute on a monthly basis will make a big difference. It will help get the message out. It will help inform more people, give them more choices. This is where you'll hear in the independent candidates and the people looking to challenge the corruption in government and the industries. But we need to get our reach out further. So please, whatever you can afford on a monthly basis, and there's some suggestions there, and it'll be automatic. All right, thank you very much for continuing to help us help you and the rest of the world on these important issues. Everybody and welcome back. You're listening to Bhavani and Ayi Green on the Progressive Radio Network, and I'm talking with my guest Leda Meredith about her new book, The Skillful Farger. And just before our break, she was going to share with us one of her favorite recipes. So, Leda, can you share with us one of your favorite recipes from some of the plants or flowers you forage? Sure. Um, one of the ones I have, I call it the Universal Greens recipe in The Skillful Forager. Um, Because it starts out, this is what my Greek grandmother would do. And you take some edible greens, could be that garlic mustard, could be wild spinach, um, could be some purslane and nettles when they're in season. There are so many good leafy greens. And wild leafy greens tend to be higher in minerals and phytonutrients than their cultivated cousins. So you're getting a, a nice superfood boost. And just to cook them down in a pan with a combination of steaming and stir fry. So a little oil, usually I'll use olive oil and a little bit of water. And you sort of steam off the water and the plant steams first, and then it cooks a little bit and gets coated in the oil. And I'll usually throw in um, some field garlic or wild onion if I have them. If not, some cultivated um, is fine. And then you've got already a little salt and you're good to go. That's sort of basic greens preparation. Um, but with that, you can also make other recipes. That's like step one. And one of my favorite things to do is wild col cannon, which is basically Irish mashed potatoes, usually with a lot of cabbage or kale chopped in and some onion. But if you take those wild greens that you already cooked up, um, in the pan, and then you chop those up and add them to the mashed potatoes. And it's just a wonderful combination. And you were talking about, getting kids to eat their fresh vegetables. I find kids will eat green coal can and they love green mashed potatoes. <laughs> so it's a good does way. It make, to... Does it make the potatoes green or does it green. stay separate? Bright green. Um, really? So it doesn't really dye the potatoes, but if you put enough of the greens chopped, you know, minced and mash them into the potato, the whole thing is a nice rich uh, green and absolutely delicious. And you're getting your leafy green, green vegetable along with all the comfort food texture of the mashed potatoes mm-hmm. and you you put make the mashed potatoes the regular way you, you can make them regular mashed potatoes with butter and sour cream or you can make them vegan if you want right exactly, exactly. milk yeah. or however you do it uh-huh cool sounds delicious maybe i'll try it with them um 
And um, what about edible bark? I know there's like white pine and there's, you know, other bark that people. There um, are, yeah, there are actually a lot of edible barks. And um, I included those in the book because um, I was frustrated at how little information there was in, in the books that I had for the most part. There are a few sources out there. But there are a lot of um, foraging books that will just say, and also has edible inner bark. But that's all they tell you. <laughs> they don't tell you how to prepare it or how to gather it. And there's a danger when you're collecting bark. You can actually kill the tree um, if you harvest the bark incorrectly. So there's definitely a sustainable harvesting uh, learning curve. And there are a few ways to do it that do not harm the trees. Um, and it's... It's not the rough outer bark that we're talking about that's kind of the protective skin of the tree. It's the layer under that, in between that outer bark and the wood. And that, that cambium layer underneath is actually quite moist and quite sweet. Um, that's the layer where water is coming up from the roots of the tree. And sugars produced by photosynthesis are coming down from the leaves of the tree. So you've got like sugars and water traveling through that, that thin layer. Um, so it's not at all like a rough, what most people think of when they think bark is, ooh, it's going to be kind of yeah. sawdusty. And it's not at all. Um, and so when harvested correctly so that it's not uh, um, har harming the tree, you end up with a food that you can dry and grind into a kind of flour that I use in pancakes or muffins or breads. Um, or my you mentioned pine. Um, and with some pines... It's a really fun trick where you can take that, that thin layer of the inner bark and actually fry it up um, in a little oil or butter. And it, I kid you not, really does taste remarkably like bacon. And I had some, I had some vegan friends accuse me of trying to feed them bacon, and I assured them, no, this is pine bark. <laughs> really? Yeah. Uh, and a little interesting uh, fact, the Adirondacks, you know, like the, the region and the famous chair, um, the Adirondack was the name that um, the Iroquois gave to this these native peoples in that region, and it it meant bark eater. So that actually means bark eater because that was one of their main foods. It was almost like rice or wheat uh, to other cultures. You would have always had some flatbread or something that was made out of bark. Uh huh. And what's the nutritional value of that? I mean, you're eating it instead of bacon. Is there any protein? There's yeah, there's definitely carbohydrate from the sugars. Um, again, this right. is the this is the transport layer of the tree. Um, like I said, this is where water is coming up from the roots through the rest. Where you of get the tree. maple syrup from, right? It's where you get maple syrup. Well, right. maple syrup you're actually tapping uh, not just the bark, um, but um, but yeah. So you're you're talking sweet. There's a lot of sugar in there. There is right. some protein. Um, there are quite a few minerals um, that's coming up in the water from the roots. So the thing with minerals in plant foods, wild or cultivated, is there are only as many minerals in the plant as there are in the soil. So if you have a very, you know, calcium rich soil, anything growing there is going to have more calcium than something that's growing in a calcium poor soil because um, the minerals are coming into the plant from from the soil but in that transport there typically there'll, there'll be quite a few minerals um and the the flavors are surprising i mean not just the <laughs> the pine bacon um but there are some like linden that almost has a cucumber taste uh so just some really surprising flavors interesting um and so is it very complicated to to tell us a little bit of how you harvest without hurting the tree, or should we just get the book and figure and do it that way? <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to do a shameless book plug and say get the book, but uh, but I, I will give you a, a <laughs> clue. Um, the the thing that you do not want to do is what's called girding the tree, where you cut a layer of bark all the way around the trunk of the tree. That will definitely kill the tree um, because what happens is that the water and nutrients are coming up from the roots. They hit your cut and they can't get to the rest of the tree. And the carbohydrates produced by photosynthesis are coming down from the leaves and trying to get to the roots, and they hit your cut, and they can't get to the roots. Um, so you, that's that's how you can go wrong with that. So the harvesting uh -huh. technique has to avoid making a complete circle around the trunk of the tree. You, you never gird Got the it. tree when you're, when you're gathering. Yeah. 
Got it. Thanks. So in your book, you also highlight the magnolia tree. Mm-hmm. You've talked yeah. about why people love that tree so much. Yeah, I mean, besides the pure eye candy, because it's so gorgeous in the early it spring. It is gorgeous. <laughs> and I have one of those, too. I have okay. a linden tree. I have a magnolia tree. I'm very excited. Very excited. <laughs> Your linden, I um, I hope you'll get out there when it's, is it flowering yet? It should be about time. Not uh, quite. Not okay, quite. yeah, soon. Um, and those wonderful aromatic flowers um, not only make a, a beautiful tea, but you can play with using them, putting them in honey and infusing the honey with them and then mm-hmm. using the honey. You can uh, make like cordials and digestive liquors by soaking them in alcohol of your choice. Uh-huh. Uh Anyway, I hope you'll play with your linden tea. <laughs> Great. Yeah, the bees the bees love those flowers. Yeah. Um, but the magnolia, um, this it, the both the flower buds and the petals are edible. And my favorite part, I've seen recipes around for like pickled magnolia petals, and that's that's kind of fun. Um, but I love the unopened, you know those fuzzy flower buds that the magnolia gets, those pointy fuzzy flower buds mm-hmm. have a magnificent smell and taste that's it's like a spice it's like if you took clove and nutmeg and something floral and kind of combined it all so i will take those and either just crush them a little bit or grate them fresh or dried and again i'm using them as a spice to infuse other things so you can make a beautiful custard for example by infusing milk or nut milk with those magnolia buds and then proceeding with your custard recipe of choice and you get that floral nutmeggy uh, aromatic ingredient that's really not like anything you can buy in the store. Um, something to know is that you can start harvesting those really in a couple of months. So, you know, by a couple of months after the big flower show in the spring, the trees are already producing the flower buds for next year's flowers. Mm-hmm. Now, of course, don't go crazy because every flower bud that you pick off your magnolia tree to use as a spice is one less flower that you're going to have next spring. That's what I was going to ask you. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh-huh. so don't go too crazy with it. Um, but again, it's not something it, you use it as a spice, not as a vegetable. So it's not something you're going to use a lot of. But they are absolutely wonderful to work with. And um, they keep really well. You can dry them and, and they'll last you until next spring. Uh-huh. Now, I know foraging is so much more popular now than it had been, and especially urban foraging, and I know you do a lot of that here in the New York City area. Are you worried about pollution and, um, you know, any legal issues with gathering plants? But I'm more concerned, I guess, pollution. I mean, I, NPR this morning was talking about lead, you know, in McCarran Park, you know, and uh, the lead levels and all of that stuff. When you're gathering wild plants from an urban area, doesn't that pick up some of the metals, et cetera? It can. Um, there are, pollution is definitely something to be aware of. Um, and in the case of heavy metals, um, it's never a good idea to gather right on a heavily trafficked road. Um, but what I have found by doing soil samples, especially in New York City, is that it's so spot specific. So, you know, one person's backyard tests completely clean and the other one has super high levels of mercury. Um, so it's worth it if it's a new to you foraging spot that you've found. Um, it's free to send in a soil sample and and comes back quick and you can send it to BBG or you can send it to Cornell Lab. And they will tell you if the so- what's what's going on with the soil. Um, so just where is it free? I I you know it, I thought it adds up. It's like twenty dollars a a sample, uh, is it? If, if you contact your county extension, um, they will send you a whole little kit. Uh huh. Yeah. Oh, good. And it's uh, free if you go with their kit. If you go with their kit. Yeah. Ah. Okay. Good. Good if to you, know. If you do it to the botanical garden or, or the university, then you have to pay. But, mm-hmm. but if you go through county extension, um, they are supposed to do it for you. Uh huh. So, and what so, do you what do you credit all the popularity for foraging is? You know, I think it's because it's such a crossroads of interest. So on my foraging tours, especially my urban foraging tours, I get people coming for so many different reasons that all converge in the topic of foraging. So some people come because they're like 
into the survival, you know, would I be able to survive if Armageddon happens kind of uh, look, you know, lost in the woods scenario. And then I have restaurant chefs who come because we're talking about wonderful gourmet ingredients like those magnolia buds um, that you're not going to be able to buy at any store. And they want fun things to play with in the kitchen. And then you have people mm-hmm. who come because they want to save money. And we are talking about free food. Uh, and people who want to get back in touch with what is local and seasonal, and nothing is more local and seasonal than the plant that's growing wild at your feet. Um, right. So all of those, all of those factors converge, and and I think also there's for people who are aware of it um, an urgency a little bit because this is cultural knowledge that we have come very close to losing. So, you know. For example, my grandmother knew which plants to tell me to pick. Um, most of my friends would have no idea. In World War II, um, when there was rationing in England, even in London, people were going out to the hedgerows and picking the blackberries and picking calendula to use um, medicinally. And they may not have wanted to. Um, it was a horrible circumstance. But the fact that they knew which plants to pick and one generation later, already people didn't have that knowledge anymore. Mm-hmm. So I think that's a, there's also a sense of let's not um, let's not lose that knowledge. Let's pass it on. Yeah, absolutely. You know, that's one of the things I love about slow food. You know, I was talking about them at the beginning of the show. The slow food movement is really trying to bridge g- gaps with indigenous tribes and. First mm-hmm. Nations and people, you know, Native cultures that have these this special knowledge that we don't want to lose. I mean, and, you know, and it's getting lost even within their own communities. Um, so, you know, there's, you know, uh, Native American chefs that are coming up now, you know, really trying to bring back some of the foods that we don't even know of. Yeah, it's wonderful. Yeah, it is. It is. So um, do you have any classes coming up in the New York area or anywhere else, I guess, in the country that people might want to? Yeah, I will have classes coming up both in New York and on the West Coast um, later on in the summer and then continuing on into the fall. And those will all be up on the calendar on my website. Um, And I'll be updating that um, by the end of this month, actually. So check in this month and you'll be able to see if I'm going to be in your neck of the woods. Okay. You want to share with everybody your website info? Again? Sure. It's uh, ledameredith.com. So L E D A M E R E D I T H.com. And people can also um, find a lot of recipes from my books that are up, you know, for free if they want to take them off the website. Uh huh. And um, we only have a couple minutes left, but maybe we could just talk really briefly about the pickling book that you just came out with. First off, I want to know, I've been trying to write a book for 10 years and I haven't managed one yet. How did you buy, how did you come out with two books at the same time? It kind of, figure. yeah, <laughs> it was a little insane and I don't actually recommend it as a writing process. <laughs> Um, but what, what happened was I had already started working on uh, Skillful Forager and then I got approached about doing the pickling book, um, and originally they wouldn't have come out at the same time, but we held on to um, Skillful Forager for basically foraging season for spring, because releasing right, it in the right, winter didn't right. make, make you know, too much sense. Um, so, yeah, so the books caught up with each other. Um, but the pickling book, it's called Pickling Everything, and it is literally that. So it includes not only pickled vegetables, but um, pickled seeds, pickled fruits. I even have pickled cheese in there. Um, And it includes both vinegar-based pickles and probiotic fermented ones. So both methods of pickling. Yeah. And can you just briefly and really briefly explain (laughs) the difference for my listeners? Because um, some people don't know that there's a difference between, you know, making a pickle with vinegar versus a probiotic. So in both cases, you're using the pH of the brine to make it safe and kill off any harmful bacteria. With vinegar pickling, the acidity of the vinegar does that for you, but it is not necessarily a live probiotic food. With fermentation, um, you usually start out with a salt brine that gradually through some healthy bacteria, think like 
yogurt culture, you know, or kombucha, um, healthy bacteria in there work on the food and end up creating an acidic brine um, that also preserves the food. But that kind of pickle is live. And um, so you usually don't can that or process it. And um, they both have their benefits. And that has to be refrigerated if it's that live. That has to be refrigerated. And one of the benefits of vinegar pickles is that it is possible to can them, seal the jars, and store them at room temperature. Right, right. But when, you know, if somebody, just for people to know, if you're buying sauerkraut, there's a difference between mm-hmm. the jarred kind on the jar, on the shelf or the probiotic one that you're finding in the refrigerator. Right. A lot of people, I think, don't know the difference and why is one much cheaper than the other. And that's exactly. The and if, if, you're, if you're going for the probiotic health benefits, then you want the one that's in the refrigerator. Right. Right. Absolutely. Lena, thank you so much. What a wealth of knowledge. And I'm, I love those birds. You're so lucky. Uh, <laughs> you know, that's one thing that spring, you know, even in New York, I mean, just waking up to the birds, but there's nothing like birds in the jungle. Uh, they're just, exactly. they're just well, a big orchestra. Well, thank you so much for having me back on. It was a pleasure. You're welcome. Everyone out there, have a great rest of the week. Enjoy this weather. It's really beautiful, and I will see you all, all again next week. And I hope to see you at some of those slow food events I mentioned at the beginning. All these things you can find on my website at Bavani at ieGreen.com. Bye for now. Have a great week. Kaya mania.